All right, guys. So this one is the part two of the. Oh, sorry. Let me. All right, guys. So this is the part two of the cardiovascular system. So with this one, we will move on from the heart to the vascular portion. So cardiovascular. So we will start to talk about the vascular portion of the cardiovascular system. And then this portion, uh, if you want to see more of the uh, textbook, this you can find this from the textbook guide and hall, chapter 14 to 18. Uh, but uh, but as you 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 know as you already know that um, in terms of the exam and the quizzes, uh, all the questions are coming from the lecture only. So the textbook could be a good like a reference that you can go back and read. But if you just worry about the exams, uh, you don't need to read those uh, components. But if you do have any question, you can. You can email me or ask me during the office hour or email me right now and uh, um, and uh, or you can read the textbook. So the circulation is is a portion that complete this uh, cardiovascular system. So as, as we already know that the function of the heart is to pump the blood. So what we have talked about the major function of the heart is to pump the blood. And the blood has to come out of the heart to go somewhere. And that going somewhere is through this circulation system. Circulation can be, dis divide, uh, can be uh, divided to two circulation. One is called systemic circulation. That is a circulation to pro provide the blood to, to provide the oxygenized blood to the body. Um, and the, the other one is the pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary circulation is to pump this low oxygen blood or the oxygenized blood to the lung. And through the lung, they can get oxygenized. And that's why we, we breathe. The function of the lung is to expose the blood to the air, with the air through this, uh, alveoli and uh, um, and uh, the oxygen binds on hemoglobin each heart, each hemoglobin can bind four oxygen a molecule and that go back to the heart complete this uh, pulmonary circulation so one can use this one so here is the heart uh, from the right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation to the left atrium. So here we get this oxygenized blood. The oxygenized blood going from the left ventricle through aorta to the systemic circulation. And that carry the blood to the different organ. And in the organ, uh, this blood will go flow from the artery to the capillary. And in the capillary, capillary has a very thin vessel wall. So it allows the substance to be exchanged from the blood to the tissue. Uh, that include the oxygen to the tissue, as well as the CO2 generates from the tissue back to the blood. Uh, and then this deoxygenized when blood drop, deliver this oxygen to the local tissue. Blood carry this, uh, the red blood cell carry the deoxygenized hem hemoglobin. So hemoglobin complete its work. And uh, this hemoglobin without oxygen will flow back to the heart, to the right, right atrium, to the right ventricle and the right ventricle provide the pressure, push the blood to the pulmonary circulation. And here, the blood will 
go from the veins to the artery, and uh, it will go into the um, go into the uh, capillary again. Again, here the capillary. Capillary is a place that we have very thin vessel wall, so it allows substance to be exchanged from the blood to the tissue, as well as from the tissue to the heart, to the blood. And here we get the oxygen exchange. Um, that oxygen, substance exchange, that the oxygen will go into the blood and the CO2 go into the lung. And then this oxygenized blood will flow back to the heart and uh, complete that pulmonary circulation. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the blood circulation. So one thing that you want to, uh, I want you to get uh, like a, a, a concept, a, a very uh, important concept is that the blood basically the one of the major work of the blood is to deliver oxygen. Okay, um, about ninety-seven of the oxygen delivered through the red blood cells. Through the uh, through this uh, hemoglobin binding of the oxygen, and that is a function of the circulation. So to do that, you need to to deliver oxygen. You can consider it's like a, a airport shuttle, okay, or airport Uber. That their job is to go to the airport right here to pick up the customer. Here we pick up the oxygen, and then the next stop is to deliver it in uh, either the mall or a hotel or downtown, etc. When they deliver it, they finish it and go back to the airport to pick up the customer. So that basically is what blood is doing. So here you need to know that basically each red blood cell has two location two conduct the substance exchange. And uh, that happens to, to be in the capillary. So it's either the pulmonary capillary or the tissue capillary. So it go to the pulmonary, go to lung capillary, pick up the oxygen, deliver into the local tissue capillary. Along this way, uh, artery or vein, this is like highway, so they don't, hi artery and the veins has a thick, very thick vessel wall. So substance cannot get exchanged. Substance can only get exchanged when the blood are flowing through the capillary. It's either a tissue capillary or the pulmonary capillary, okay? So, so that's the one thing that you need to keep in mind that's blood basically even though the majority of the blood are in the, you know, the probably you see that the majority, most of its time is in the artery or in the vein or in the heart. But during that time, there's no substance exchange. It's only traveling. But the, uh, only when they are in the capillary, there is a substance exchange. So have that in mind. We know that, we should know that, even though the circulation include the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation, these two circulation connect in series. You go to a pulmonary circulation to get the oxygen. The next stop gonna be in the systemic circulation to deliver the oxygen. And then you go back to the pulmonary circulation to pick up the oxygen. So these two connected in series. It's not like a parallel, they connect in series. So here you can see that we can, if, you, if we spread out that circulation, not like tangle all together, but we spread it out, we can see that these two circulation are connected in series. Meaning that you cannot, you, Connecting series that you mean means that all the blood has to go through one in order to do to the next one. You have to go through the pulmonary first, 
then go to the systemic. And then before you go to systemic, you have to go to a pulmonary, then go to a systemic pulmonary superior. So these two are connected in series. One, have that in mind, you need to also know that this blood, when it goes to the tissue, when it goes to the tissue, it drop, it delivers that oxygen to the tissue. It has to go back to the pulmonary to pick up the oxygen. You don't have, you won't have the blood going to one tissue, then going to the other tissue, then going to the other tissue. In general, there are some exceptions, but in general, blood going to one tissue, deliver the oxygen, that's it. You know, then you go back to the pulmonary. So you don't see, and the blood going to each of these organs are connected in parallel. In parallel means that you have to choose one. You don't go all of them. You don't go through all of them or two of them. You have to pick one. You either go to this tissue because once you go there, you deliver the oxygen. You have no value to other organ, okay? Because you have no oxygen. You have to go back to the pulmonary. And when you go, when you, when you leave the pulmonary to the tissue, you have to choose one. You choose to go to one of the organ, then you complete the work. You deliver the oxygen. Then you go back to, back to the, the lung to pick up the oxygen. This is also very much like a, like a mama, mommy bird, right? The bird uh, flying, fly out to find the worm. And when it find the worm, it fly back to the nest. Now in the nest, you've got five little baby here waiting for the worm and you give it to one of it. That's it, you know, you, then you don't have the worm. You have to fly out again. So this different organs are like baby birds. They are waiting for the oxygen. And once you deliver it, that's it. You don't go to the next one, to the next. So the blood circulation of different organs are connected in parallel. They are they are they are one or the other. It's not like one and the other, one or the other. And then in parallel. Okay. So that's the uh, concept about the circulation. Another thing you need to know about this circulation, this circulation include uh, different uh, vessels as well as the heart, right? Heart contains some blood, but a lot of blood are traveling in the vessels. Um, artery typically has high blood pressure. Capillary is a region that we have a substance exchange. Veins, on the other hand, veins has uh, contains the most of the blood. The reason is that vein has high compliance, meaning that if you have blood, the vessel will distend and that can carry, that can store a lot of blood. So vein is the veins are blood pools. That's where we have a lot of blood. So a easy quiz question is that which segments in the cardiovascular system contains the most of the blood. Either the veins, artery, heart, etc. The answer is veins, especially the systemic veins, because veins can distend. Their size can be expanded when there is a coming incoming blood. So that's something you need to keep in mind. And uh, here is the uh, blood pressure distribution from the heart to the tissue. Okay, so here from the heart, we talk about the heart in the, in the, during the systole contraction will push the blood pressure increase. That pressure increase if it's above the threshold, it push blood into the aorta and the pulmonary artery. 
and then the valve, the semilunar valve closed. Then ventricle continue to diastole. And, uh, so the pressure in the ventricle can vary between zero to about the highest, say 120. When we deliver that pressure into the artery, into the aorta, the largest artery direct, directly leaving the, uh, the, the heart, the pressure will range from the 120, the highest, to the diastole 80, because after lower than 80, the valve close. And the aorta would not drop the blood pressure lower than that, that, that like a point when the valves are closed. So that's the pressure range in the aorta, about 120 and 80. So this is in the like normal healthy people, if it's in hypertension, you will have uh, the range much, much higher. If it's low bar pressure, you have the range much lower. So this is systolic pressure, 120, diastolic pressure, about 80. So this is the pressure in the aorta. And the pressure continue to drop through the systemic circulation. Pressure become the lowest in the veins. Then go to the pulmonary circulation in the pulmonary ventricle. The range is about 20 something to zero. And, uh, and the pulmonary artery pressure is high, push the blood, this the oxygen blood into the pulmonary capillary, get the oxygenized back to the veins and back to the heart. So what, what, what's the point here? The point here is that here we have different vessel, right? As we mentioned before, artery, veins, capillary. Arteries are the one to experience those high pressure. Veins basically very low pressure. So that's one thing. The second thing you, you need to know is that so we, we, we are typically, for the, for the health purpose, that we are typically interested in the uh, systemic pressure and the diastolic pressure, right? So we measure that. Uh, very common in the clinical practice. And when we measure it, we measure where? In the arm, right? So in the arm, we have the large artery. One thing I want to pay attention is that, uh, keep in mind is that, even though we don't measure directly from the aorta, but, it, but the blood pressure in the large artery is very much the same like the pressure in the aorta. So it's close enough, even though we don't measure it from the aorta. Here, I give you some numbers, systemic pressure, systemic uh, diastolic pressure is 120, systolic pressure, sorry, systolic pressure 120, diastolic pressure is 80. And uh, uh, the pulmonary, Systolic pressure is 25, diastolic pressure is 8. You don't need to uh, memorize this number, just you know, have a sense that this is range, especially for the 120, 80, these numbers are, are more important because this is are the number that you typically hear from the blood pressure measurement. That you know that this is a typical number. If you hear people saying that his uh, blood pressure is 140 something to 90 something, then you have the idea that, okay, you are in the range of the uh, hypertension. So that's the bar pressure. Now, let's look at the structure of the vessel. So here I'm showing you that different vessel has different size. Here you show you the diameter, the wall thickness, Aorta, the largest artery, diameter is 25 millimeter, is about one inch, less than, a little bit less than one inch. And the, the, the wall thickness is two millimeter. And you can see that the size gradually drop to the capillary. Capillary diameter is about eight micrometer. This is size, about the same size of the each red blood cells. And you can see that the thickness is 0 0.5. As I mentioned before that the capillary wall is very thin and uh, 
and that that thinness is needed so substance can easily diffuse across and that allows substance exchange in the capillary from the blood to the tissue and from the tissue to the blood. Um, another thing you need to know is that the components in the blood vessel, as you can see, it's very much similar. Even though the size are vary a lot, the thickness varies a lot, but the components are very similar. We have the endothelium cells in the very inner layer of the vessel wall, elastic tissue, the next one, smooth muscle, and the, the fibrous tissue on the very outer portion of the vessel wall. So we basically have all these four components in all vessels except in the capillary because capillary is one that we really need to have very thin vessel wall. Otherwise, if we have all these four components in the vessel wall, in the capillary, then it's just too thick, you know, it's, there will be no substance exchange. Your oxygen will not be able to deliver. So we, in the capillary is one exception that it only has the endothelium cells, single layer endothelium cells in the capillary. They don't have other components. Artery, veins, they all have these four components, endothelium, elastic tissue, smooth muscle, fibrous tissue. Okay, so the quiz question here would be, which vessel doesn't have smooth muscle, for example? Okay, the answer would be the capillary. Capillary doesn't have the smooth muscle. Which vessels contains endothelium? All vessels have, has the endothelium. Endothelium is the single layer of the, uh, located in the very inner portion of the vessel. So endothelium basically is the one that form the very inner portion, very inner layer of the vessel wall. So that's that. This one also give you another concept that is the cells compose of the vessel. Vessels, the vessel wall is composed of two type of cells. Okay, two type of cells. One is the endothelium cell. The other one is smooth muscle. So there are two cells, two types of cells in the vessel wall. Endothelium cells, the cells construct the very inner layer. And that's smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is important to cause because those are the muscle cells. They control the vessel diameter, okay? When the when 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 when, when vessel uh, smooth muscle contract the vessel wall, the vessel diameter becomes smaller. When the vessel when the smooth muscle relax, the vessel diameter become larger. So this one is important to conduct the vessel constriction and the vessel dilation. All right, so there are the major components in the, in the vessel ves, vascular wall include the endothelium cells. This is the single layer, continuous layer in the very inner portion of the uh, vessel wall. Elastic fibers, <coughs> smooth muscle, all, cell, all vessels has the smooth muscles to conduct the contraction, but not the epithelium, but not the capillary. And uh, uh, the collagen fibers are the most outer portion to kind of provide some protection and uh, structural support to the vessel. vessel. All right, so here is 
a typical picture of the artery, for example, the artery. So in general, the vessel wall can be divided into three zones. A very inner portion is called tunica intima. So here, the major cell is the endothelium cell. You can see these are the endothelium cell connect together to form very inner portion. You need to, we need to know that these endothelium cells are very uh, important in a way that these endothelium cells are the cells facing the blood. And uh, there are so many things can happen to the blood. When you eat, your glucose level increase. When you have fever, the immune cells circulating through it, immune cells can also release a lot of uh, cytokines. And uh, uh, when you have some infection, etc., they may remain in the blood. They may stay in the blood. When the person has blood pressure increase, the high blood pressure, the first thing they do is they apply that force to the vessel wall. And the first cell to experience that stress, that, that, that pressure is the endothelium cells. So endothelium cells is, is very key. I feel like endothelium cell probably is most important component to, to affect the health. A lot of disease are basically initiated by the damage in the endothelium cells. Um, a lot of the chronic disease are, are because of that chronic condition, uh, adversity affects the endothelium cells and, uh, and the damage of the endothelium cell can, can have the major consequence to the to the damage to the basal. All right, so this is the tunica intima, and then the middle portion is the tunica media. The tunica media has the smooth muscle. This smooth muscle, the function is to, con 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 to provide the basal constriction, basal dilation. They're, they are very important in the way that, um, uh, for example, that, um, the, uh, the, the healthy endothelium cell here, endothelium cell, healthy endothelium cells can respond to the pressure quite dynamically. So if the pressure increase, they can expand the vessel wall. So to kind of absorb this extra like, pressure. And uh, that's conducted by the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, NO, uh, we will talk about it. So it's a, it's a NO, it's a like gas, gas type of the uh, molecule. Uh, endothelium cell may release NO. NO will act on the uh, muscle cells to make the muscle relax. So if the pressure increase, the stress force will cause the endothelium cell to release NO to, to make the muscle relax and uh, to make the the muscle to, to make the diameter increase to absorb that increased amount of the blood pressure. And that's, that's a healthy response of the vessel wall. However, if the endothelium cells injured, they will not release NO. And, uh, and then the vessel wall will not respond to it healthy in a healthy way. And then the vessel wall become more rigid because the muscle is not relaxed due to the due to the lack of the NO, and then the vessel will become rigid, and that is, you know, not good. Um, the rigid vessel wall in high blood pressure condition will very quickly develop a lot of uh, vessel disease. So, so that's the uh, tunica media. The major component is the smooth muscle. Then the tunica externa, that's the region that we have the outer portion of the basal wall. So that three zones, 
two types of the cells in the vessel. So this is the typical artery. If we compare artery and the vein, we see that they have a lot in common. They all have the three zones, tunica, uh, intima, containing these uh, endothelium cells, tunica media, contains the uh, smooth muscle, and tunica externa, the outer portion. So these two are very common. Uh, the artery has thicker vessel wall because artery experience the high pressure, so it has it has to have a thicker vessel wall to 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 be able to sustain that proper pressure. Veins has thinner vessel wall, and the one thing also unique in the veins is that it contains the valve. It's because that the the blood pressure in the veins are so low that blood flow become very slow. And uh, in the artery, you have the blood coming from high pressure to low pressure. So you, you basically don't need to worry about the back flow, the blood flow only in one direction. But in the veins, the pressure is so low, so you need to have some mechanism to prevent the backflow of the blood, and that's valve four. So when blood go in here, it will not go back. And that's the way that we can continually push the blood to the, toward the heart. As in addition to the valve, you, if one thing that we can also do is to do the uh, exercise. When we, when we contract our skeletal muscle, when we move our skeletal muscle, that can squeeze the veins and that can also promote the blood flow back to the heart. So the unique part of the vein, that if we compare veins and the artery, vein has the valve. So here showing you that the, uh, the, from the heart, we have the large artery to the smaller arterial, and uh, that blood, that oxygenized blood going to the capillary and then going to the vein, going back to the heart, all right? So, and you can see that basically all of them, all of them uh, uh, artery in the vein has three zones, tunica, intima, media, and the externa. So that's the artery and the veins. The next up, let's talk, let's take a look, close look at this capillary. So a uh, capillary has only a single layer, as I mentioned before. And, uh, and uh, even though it looks small, it's, it's, but it actually is very important because that is the place we have the substance exchange. In the artery and the veins, the wall is so thick that you basically cannot have substance exchange. But in the capillary, we only have single layer, and that's where we have the substance exchange. So as I mentioned before, that the capillary is a place that we have the substance exchange. Uh, we we basically, all the blood will go through either the pulmonary capillary to get the oxygen and then go to one of these organ capillary to deliver the oxygen. So substance exchange is, is, uh, is um, uh, uh, happens in the capillary. So let's look at the capillary. The major function is the substance exchange, all right? So nutrients like glucose, like um, proteins, uh, amino acids actually, uh, the monomer of the uh, protein, amino acids, um, because protein is already very big, we need to digest it in order to get the amino acid. And then, you know, um, 
vitamin, uh, these important uh, nutrients, as well as the metabolic waste products are exchanged through the capillary wall, okay? This substance change uh, happens in the capillary wall through four major pathway, uh, include diffusion, because you can see here we have the single layer of the capillary wall. And uh, this layer is composed of the endothelium cell. So each one is a cell. And uh, so basically, if it's lipid, so this cell has a cell membrane that is the phospholipid. So that's the lipid. So any lipid substance can diffuse across very freely, very easily, which include um, this re, 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 uh, refer to the the earlier lecture that we talked about the cells, right? That's the reason that we, we kind of give you guys a like a, a review of what's going on in the cells. The cell membrane can allow substance diffuse across, uh, include gases, right? O2, CO2, water. Uh, steroid hormone uh, and uh, vitamin A, D, K, E. So those lipid soluble substance can easily freely diffuse across the cell membrane, okay? So they can diffuse across. This is thin enough. Diffusion basically defines, is uh, inhibited by the thickness as well. So, so since this is uh, thin enough, and so substance can diffuse through quite easy. We also have a intercellular cleaves that's here, intercellular cleaves, that's the, some cleaves here. This one allowed water soluble substance to diffuse across. We also have a fenestration, it's not showing here. We also have a transcytosis through capillary. So we will talk about all these four. So the very first one is the diffusion. This one allows the lipid soluble substance. So here is the cell membrane showing you that only lipid soluble substance that include the important one, O2, CO2. And also, as I mentioned before, water can diffuse through through this uh, membrane because water, even though it's not lipid soluble, but water molecule is small enough to diffuse across. We also have a uh, uh, steroid hormone, vitamin A, D, K. So this can move across from vessel to the blood from the blood to the tissue or from the tissue to the blood through diffusion. And then the next one is, so that one was uh, lipid soluble. The next one is water soluble. Water soluble can diffuse across the intercellular cleave. And uh, um, there are spaces between adjacent endothelium cell. And as a water soluble substance can diffuse across. And the, that size, this intercellular cleave, the size can be different depending on the organs. Like in the liver, this space is wide open. So it's very free diffusion. But if it's in some other organ, they can be very tight. And that Intercellular cleaves are controlled by a type of transmembrane protein called tight junction. So here is showing you the tight junction. This tight junction has two transmembrane protein bind together, and that tight junction can regulate the amounts or the size of that intercellular cleaves 
to define that how free the substance can diffuse across through these intercellular cliffs. So that's the, the, I want to use this one to kind of give you an overview of what we have learned about this cellular junction because we already talked about this is the tight junction that we just talked about. This one is an example of the epithelium cell. And, uh, and you can see that um, we earlier talked about in the cardio muscle, we talked about the uh, desmosomes. To glue, to provide the cellular adhesion between two cardio myocytes. In the heart cells, we also see, saw this uh, gap junction. Gap junction provide the channel that ion can diffuse from one cell to the next cells. And that is how all different muscle cells can be excited all together because their intracellular space are basically share with each other. And today we learn another cellular junction complex, that's the tight junction. And the tight junction is the one to control how much the fluid can diffuse through that intercellular cleaves. And so these three group of the uh, cellular junction are very common, not just in the endothelium, but across different kind of like uh, organ system. Uh, tight junction is one to control the, to regulate the intercellular cleaves. The uh, desmosome complex are the one to provide the adhesion of two neighboring cells. Gap junction provide a channel that the intracellular components can share with one another. So that's the three different cellular junction and they have, they serve different functions. So that's the intercellular cleaves. The next one is called fenestration. Fenestration is the window. So basically this one is the right here. So this one is the endothelium cell. And this, this endothelium cell is not a completely like a full, like their, their vessel wall, sorry, their cell membrane is not completely like a full, like cover. They have a, the tunnel penetrates through that, that endothelium cell, that cell. And that, that tunnel is called the fenestration. So this one provide another mechanism that water soluble substance, substance can diffuse across. This one provide that channel allow a small substance. If it's big, it probably will go through the intercellular cliffs, okay? Especially that intercellular cliffs can be, in some cases can be very wide open. Fenestration is the the hole, the, the channel in the cell. So this channel is very small and, uh, um, and that a lot of water soluble substance, but especially for the smaller ones, smaller molecule, like little ions, like simpler form of the molecule. So that's the fenestration. Uh, not all vessels has the fenestration. Uh, so uh, for those with the fenestration will be for those organ contains the capillary with the fenestration will allow the substance more freely to diffuse across. But some organs will control that substance change more tightly, especially like in the, in the, uh, in the, in the heart, in the lungs, in the muscle, in the brain. This one doesn't have the fenestration, but in some other organ, like in the GI system, in the kidney, in the uh, the endocrine endocrine 
uh, glands will, will have more of this fenestration to allow substance to diffuse across. So that's really organ dependent. So that's the fenestration. Next one is called the caviola, the, the transcytosis. So what we have here is that, remember earlier we talked about the endocytosis and the exocytosis when we talk about the cell. Basically, the, when the cell membrane has a receptor, that receptor recognizes specific molecule. When that molecule binds on the receptor, receptor will conduct an endocytosis to engulf that molecule inside of the vesicle and move that vesicle into the cells. In the same time, we have the exocytosis to move that to move anything, to move the substance in the vesicle into the extracellular space. So we have the endocytosis and the exocytosis. So that is typical endocytosis and exocytosis. If we have both work together, endo and exo, we complete a process called transcytosis. And that is the mechanism we use in the capillary. With this one, we also transport the water-soluble substance because these molecules are freely diffused in either the blood or in the extracellular space in the tissue side. Um, the unique part of this transcytosis compared to the other two interstellar cliffs and uh, fenestration. This transcytosis is more selective because you have to have the receptor to recognize that molecule, binds on it to activate an endocytosis and exocytosis. So at a, a, this transduction, this transportation is more selective. And this, this uh, we don't call it a vesicle, we call it a carburize. So this is different from the typical vesicles. So here one showing you the typical vesicles. In typical cell endocytosis, we have the vesicles here, vesicles. The typical vesicles are provided by a protein called clathrin. Clathrin is one to provide the scaffold structure to make these vesicles. In the capillary though, we don't use the clathrin immediate endocytosis. We use another one, it's called um, caviolins. So here is a caviolins, caviolins. And uh, that caviolins form the vesicles is, we call it a caviola vesicle or call it caviola. So that's the difference between the typical endocytosis that is clathrin mediated endocytosis. In the capillary, we have the caviolin constructed caviola to complete this transcytosis. So that's a quick question that which proteins are involved in the transcytosis in the capillary? Uh, that you need to choose the caviolin and the vesicle is caviolin. So which one is related to the transcytosis in the uh, capillary? Caviolin, so something like that. So that is four major mechanisms to complete the substance exchange in the capillary. We have the diffusion through the membrane. This one allow these lipid soluble substance. And this one is the one to allow oxygen CO2 exchange between the blood and the tissue. We also have inter 
cellular cliffs. This one allow water soluble substance, especially a larger one. And this intercellular cliff is regulated by a cellular junction called tight junction. We also have the transcytosis. Transcytosis is conducted by carveoli. We also have the fenestration. Uh, so this one is the transcytosis by carveoli. And we also have fenestration to allow smaller water-soluble substance to move from one side to the other. So that's the capillary uh, transcellular, tra transcellular transport. And uh, uh, that's in general four mechanism, four pathway for substance to be exchanged across the cell, across the basal wall, but that can be varied depending on the organ. In some organ, it's very open, very diffused. Like uh, here, we show you that um, the liver has more like sinusoidal vessel wall to allow water, to allow substance exchange more freely. But in some other organ, it can be very highly regulated, very tightly controlled. The opposite of the liver is the brain. Brain has very tight um, control of the substance exchange between blood and the tissue. So here you can see that capillary in general, we have the fenestration, we have the intercellular space, intercellular cleft, but in the blood, in the brain, we have the very highly controlled tight junction to prevent the intercellular cleave. We don't have the inter uh, fenestration. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, we also have the, the uh, cell in the brain to enforce that barrier. So that forms a barrier now known. It's called a blood brain barrier. That substance inside of the blood will be very difficult to enter into the brain. So the brain is a region, brain tissue is a region that um, we will have in general, we will not see immune cells to go in there unless there is uh, some like uh, uh, diseases in general that we, we, we have very tight control of that. And that's the way that we protect our brain that uh, the bacteria uh, or anything that happens in the blood will be very difficult to enter into the brain. And in the same time, if, if, we, if there is any damage that will cause very severe effects to the brain. If there is any leakage, if there is any blood vessel damage, that will cause very severe damage to the brain because brain don't usually have, the uh, brain usually have very tight blood brain barrier. If we have the quiz, uh, I'm not so sure if we have, can have this quiz, but one quiz question would be that, yes, we probably will have, but probably not here. Um, one of the cell, the brain cells that affects, that in, enforce the blood brain barrier is a cell called astrocyte. So this is one of the brain cell to enforce the blood brain barrier. All right. So, so this one summarizes uh, what we, we we all these different vessel wall in our circulation. Um, we basically has three type of the vessel: uh, artery, veins, and the capillary. Uh, when we mention each one of these, the first thing you need to think about is that what's their feature. Artery, the feature, 
is high blood pressure. Uh, artery doesn't really mean to have oxygenized blood because the pulmonary artery actually is deoxygenized blood. But all the other artery do have higher pressure than the veins. So artery has the capacity to carry the blood with high, high blood pressure. Veins um, would have very similar structure like the artery. It has three zones, tunica interma, tunica media, tunica externa. Veins like artery also have the smooth muscle. The unique portion of the vein is that it has the valve to prevent the backflow. Vents also has high compliance, so it can distend. When the pressure increase, it can distend its volume to absorb, to, to store it, to provide the room to store more blood. So vent is a place that we see the most of the blood. The, the region we have blood pool, the major blood pool in the body is in the vein. And the capillary is one that we have the substance exchange. All, all the blood, each blood, each red blood cell basically goes through two capillary beds. One is in the pulmonary to get the oxygen and then go to the local tissue to deliver the oxygen. So capillary, the unique portion of the capillary is that it has a single layer of the basal wall. This single layer is the endothelium cells. So that's the three basal wall, three vessels. All right, so have that in mind. I want to talk about one important disease. This is called the atherosclerosis. And uh, um, we have the concept about the healthy vessel, healthy circulation, what's going on with the healthy artery, healthy band, healthy capillary. What if things go wrong, right? So we, 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 we cannot talk all different diseases, but one disease I would need to, I really need you guys to know, which is the uh, atherosclerosis, because this is a major disease of, this is major damage leading to other diseases, and that is very common in our society, right? So atherosclerosis is built up of the plaque in the vessel wall. And athero, given the name, you know it's related to, to the artery. It's because that it's usually not in the veins, not in the capillary, it's in the artery. And, uh, um, and, it, and there are several reasons for that. One is artery is one to experience the high blood pressure. So uh, given that our society, uh, we have more and more people uh, develop the hypertension in an like adult age. Uh, and this situation will make that pressure affects on the artery more than in the veins. So that will cause damage. And that's one reason, okay? And uh, so the process of the development of the atherosclerosis begins by the damage to the endothelium cells. Because that endothelium cell is a very inner layer of these cells. And that can be affected by so many things. High blood pressure is one we talk about. Hyperglycemia, the prevalence of diabetes is also very common in our society. It's also very high in our society. So uh, especially nowadays that getting glucose is so easy. People drink sugar water so easy, right? And, um, and, and, and that actually starts with very young age. Um, the hyperglycemia can also affect the endothelium cells. So hypertension, hyperglycemia. Semia, inflammation, right? So those can cause damage to the endothelium cells. So the very first one is the damage to the endothelium cells. And then the endothelium cell is injured. The next thing is that 
it cannot protect the vessel wall. Furthermore, we will have the uh, lipoprotein, especially the low density lipoprotein. This low density lipoprotein contains what? They contains the major portion is the cholesterol, all right? High density lipoprotein contains more triglyceride and proteins. Low density lipoprotein, this low means low protein, but the low density lipoprotein also have higher cholesterol components in it. So this low density lipoprotein will sneak into the vessel wall because vessel wall is not protected anymore. The endothelium cannot protect it, it's already injured. And that will cause the uh, uh, start to accumulate in the uh, in the tunica intima, the very inner portion. Some smooth muscle will also migrate to the tunica intima. They, this uh, LDL will be oxidized and become triggered because that stay in the vessel wall, and we need to get rid of it, right? Our body will, will try to get rid of it. The way to get rid of it is to have the phagocytes, um, to the, have these um, monocytes coming here to engulf, to have this macros, macrophage, the monocytes, to come here to engulf, to take away, to eat this LDL. But when they eat it, somehow these cells stay there. These macrophages stay in the vessel wall. They are not leaving. And they have, are full with this LDL, a lot of cholesterol in their cells. They become a cells called form cells. And they stay there. So it continues grow, grow, grow. Eventually we have the damage. We have the, uh, the uh, uh, we trigger the blood clot on it. And uh, that form this uh, fibrous cap. Basically it's a, it's, a, it's a blood clot on top of it. This blood clot may erupt may break apart and to form this thrombosis floating around and uh, it may get stuck somewhere in a remote area to cause ischemia, to have the blood flow blockage. So that's the progress, the development of the atherosclerosis. So key questions here is that the first step, the first damage of the, endo of the atherosclerosis is damage to the endothelium cell, okay? The region, the location of region is in the tunica intima. So we have tunica intima, media, externa. Atherosclerosis is the region in the tunica intima, in the inner portion. And the LDL accumulation is important. We can have a quiz question like LDL, HDL, etc very low density lipoprotein VLDL, you need to choose the LDL. And uh, which one is the one to form the foam cells, the macrophage. Macrophage eat a lot of the LDL, become the foam cells, okay? So that's the, you need to have that in, in mind. Let's take a look at the picture here. So you have the visual understanding of what's going on here. So this is the beginning of the atherosclerosis, this vessel wall in the very beginning, you have this endothelium cell damage. Endothelium cell damage will cause the accumulation of the lipid, especially the LDL. LDL will trigger the monocytes coming here to engulf, try to clear it away. Monocytes stay to become the foamy, macrophage uh, cells or foam cells here. 
And then so you have uh, start to have these uh, fatty streaks. That's the reason why, you know, when we first, when in the earlier time, when we first try to understand this uh, atherosclerosis, we see a lot of lipid here. And so we start to blame the people eat too much of the lipid. So during a very long period of time, our society have the concept that lipid is not good. Um, so we cut lipid, everything. When people eat, they ask uh, how much lipid is it? Um, but in the end of the day, you know, people still develop this uh, uh, atherosclerosis. We realize that it's not just the lipid. Lipid is a uh, byproduct. It's because of the endothelium cell damage. And the endothelium cell damage is, is due to the hypertension. And it's also due to the diabetes, okay? Hyperglycemia and uh, hypertension can cause the damage to the endothelium cells. And that's why, you know, all right, so this, uh, uh, this accumulation of the foam cells will eventually will, will stay here. That will actually make the basal diameter become narrowing, become smalling, and uh, that affects blood flow. Blood flow used to be a, a very smooth, but now it has to see this one here. The, uh, go through this one here, and that disturbed blood flow can also uh, cause more damage to the endothelium cells, and we may have uh, the uh, trigger this uh, uh, blood clotting pathway, and a lot of clot will be formed from this thrombosis. If it's not stable, it will be flow away from this uh, thrombosis. Uh, to to block the blood flow in a remote area. So that's the sequence of this uh, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis can happen in the artery in different organs. If it's in the brain, it will eventually lead to the ischemia and that is a stroke in the brain. We have lack of the blood flow. When we have a lack of blood flow, we basically has lack of the oxygen. Cells without oxygen will die, without glucose will die. So that's the um, uh, cause of the cerebral ischemia, the brain disease, right? The stroke. If this happens to the coronary artery in the heart, then it blocks the blood supply into the heart. The, um, it will cause the cell damage in the downstream of that branch of the artery and to cause the uh, infarction and to cause the heart disease. So, so it really depends on where it happens and uh, the consequences are all very bad. I want to show you this one. This is the um, data from, I remember it's about like uh, 17, 2017. So this is data uh, showing you the leading cause of death in America. I remember we showed something like this earlier, like heart disease is the number one, cancer is the number two. The third one is the, um, chronic lower respiratory disease. So this one includes the COPD, chronic objective lung disease, pulmonary disease, uh, like uh, emphysema, et cetera. And then the third one, the fourth one is stroke, the brain disease. So you can see that the, in this top four cause of the death, two of them are related to the atherosclerosis right? The atherosclerosis in the coronary artery caused the heart disease. The atherosclerosis in the, in the brain caused the stroke. So this is quite critical, very important.
And uh, a lot of uh, research has been conducted to understand the development and also treatment of the atherosclerosis. I just want to give you a concept that you don't, you should not think that, okay, I'm young, I am, I can do whatever, you know. Uh, if you are not, if you are my age, I have kids. Um, you should know that um, this development of the atherosclerosis actually start at young age. Say by 45, 50, you start to have some, not you, but people start to have some build up of the atherosclerosis. That actually take about 20 years of the development. So this epithelium damage is actually begin very early at the young adulthood. And uh, that actually the time that you should already pay attention, like in your 20s or your kids, like teenagers, you should already pay attention on their diet, their living style to, to, uh, to, to live a healthy life. Because the initial developments of the atherosclerosis actually begin at very young age. All right, that's it for the circulation and uh, uh, we will stop here, take a rest, and then we will continue the very next one.